I'm happy to introduce our next speaker here to my left, uh, Mr. Brian Dowling. Uh, as principal and founder of SupportingAdvancement.com with over 20 years uh, of experience within the field of advancement. Uh, he joined VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation in 2008 as the Senior VP in Finance and Information Systems. And prior to that was with uh, the University of Michigan uh, in charge of technological infrastructure, gift processing, and records administration uh, as part of a $3.1 billion campaign. And with that, I will hand it off to you. Thanks. Can everybody hear? Is everybody awake? Yeah. Not as many carbs this lunch, but then they had donut hour just before that, so this will be the deadly one o'clock, about to crash, just don't know when. Uh, wonder what the person is talking about session. Um, I'm from Canada. For those of you uh, who are not sure here where that is, uh, that's the place when you're watching US network news where the weather stops. <laughs> Unless it's a blast of icy, icy cold Arctic air, which we're enjoying right now as one of our number one exports. Um, we also play hockey very well. Um, the other funny thing, this is the first presentation I've done using Windows 8.1, and I'm not quite sure how to share the screen. Uh, there's a different PowerPoint menu up there and everything else, so the uh, sort of lesson is the evil gods of demos uh, Never think that you can ever do anything live without some major kind of uh, kafoofle happening. Uh, so here's the agenda. Uh, normally if you go to church and stuff, they only have three things. Uh, there's like five things here. One of them we won't cover, so there'll be one more than is, uh, we're able to actually absorb. So, um, we'll, but we'll try and do our best to do that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, the foundation I started out, it's my first nonprofit job out of higher ed. And it's been uh, quite a learning uh, experience for me. Um, the foundation is a totally separate standalone organization. Uh, Carl Otto this morning in his presentation kind of referred to uh, the idea that uh, you know, he's worked you know, a lot in higher education, has had to deal with just advancement systems. But when you get into a foundation, you do have to deal with accounting, uh, HR, and other systems. We also run. Uh, um, Lotteries, you know those lotteries where you can win a house. So we have a lottery database. We also have grateful patient uh, information and so on and so forth. So from a uh, data perspective, an integration perspective, it's for me uh, has been um, a little bit more complicated than uh, higher education in terms of what I've had to do. Uh, we are a medium-sized organization. Uh, we our gross revenues all in are about sixty-one million dollars a year. And uh, we have about 55 staff, just to give you kind of an idea of uh, the context of what we're, um, uh, the foundation is about. You have to be careful of what I say in case people watch it on YouTube back home. And I'll just wave to the YouTube viewers and acknowledge them also. Um, been in the trenches for a while. Um, and I think you learned some things over that time. Uh, the thing I've uh, tried to do is actually the have fun, because I think what we do is uh, you know, really interesting and it can be a lot of fun. Uh, but the other thing is uh, you know, metrics, I think, are really important too. And I think that we certainly, uh, in terms of this group, most of us represent that kind of uh, measurement approach to information, measurement approach to running the organization. And I think that comes with a, uh, a set of uh, you know, key responsibilities, key expertise, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, that we need to you know, continually uh, think about uh, as we move along. I want to talk a little bit about the information world. This has been covered in, in a, uh, a number of ways at this conference already. Uh, how many went to Donald Farmer's session on squirrels, nuts, and... So, uh, Donald, you're not here, right? I already told him that I'm using some of his stuff in this because I've seen him present three times in the last year. I think that uh, his material is really interesting because when he talks about this information world, he, he overlays it continually with the context of people, how people make decisions, how people look at information, uh, the idea of squirrels foraging for nuts or users foraging for information. I think these are quite, um, you know, the growth of mobile. All this stuff, I think, is quite new and happening quite rapidly for a number of us. Um, and these things are a little bit hard to uh, kind of address. Who is familiar with Target? So they've had some interesting uh, 
data thing, so they've had a major breach, which again, I think there was a session in the conference on security and passwords. Uh, it's something you know, we have to be aware of. Um, there was also the incident uh, where a father noticed that his daughter at home was receiving uh, mailings and things, promotions from Target on pregnancy, because it was assumed she was pregnant. So he went to Target and told them that they shouldn't be receiving this, but then his daughter later told him that she was pregnant. <laughs> so um, to me, there's also a, uh, you know, this bottom part here, you know, privacy, ethics, those types of things, I think, are something that we all need to uh, address in terms of our day-to-day -day work. Um, I can ruin a person's career by presenting the visualization that puts their work in a bad light. That's an easy thing for me to do, and no one else will know that I did it, right? Because, you know, they are not sure where the information comes from. So I think that there's a couple things here, especially uh, with some of these new tools and techniques. The idea of uh, information neutrality and information ethics, and I think sometimes these things are under-addressed as part of all this, uh, these other uh, things that we're seeing. Uh, mobile cloud, big data, um, you know, the most common kind of buzzwords we're hearing out there. Uh, this is a, a slide I've used for uh, about 25 years. And it used to be that these three bubbles, uh, biographical solicitation and gift information, typically that's the only things we had in our system. And the kind of the sweet spot where that intersect, intersected was the donor profile. And the donor profile typically has or had uh, or will have or always will have home address, business address, maybe some bio information, maybe some giving information, and then maybe who they're assigned to, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's also now web information uh, coming in from our online communities, from Facebook, from uh, LinkedIn. Uh, we have this incredibly complicated data model, and this is not just in higher education. In higher education, you have the student load, you have uh, faculty and staff loads. Uh, when I was at Michigan and we were looking at system replacement, we had 42 different feeds into the fundraising system, and those were only the ones that we knew about. So the idea of uh, big data, I think, especially in higher education, especially in fundraising, you know, we've already been kind of doing big data uh, for a number of years. I think for me, what big data means additionally uh, to the small data we have is, are things that uh, come from external databases. So if you go to, for instance, Microsoft's Azure Marketplaces, Marketplace and other public data sources, you can now buy data. And if you're using Excel and you're using Power Query, you can join things like uh, public data into your other queries directly in Excel. So uh, an example in healthcare is we can join to the World Health Organization database which has a whole bunch of stuff on different uh, diseases, patterns, and things like that. And we can join that to our fundraising data by fiscal year or by area and, and, and overlay those trends. So I think in terms of um, fundraising, we're starting to see uh, you know, these ideas and things that are uh, uh, kind of out there that haven't been there before. So our, um, you know, the complexity of what we do and the complexity of what we have to bring together and the complexity of how we manage it, I think, has increased exponentially uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and I don't think that trend is going to stop. Um, I think, you know, in terms of our resources, what's happened is if you started with 100,000 entities and you add 10,000 per year, you have 150,000. If each one of those additional 50,000 people has an address to maintain, all of a sudden, at a minimum, you have 30% more data to maintain, but I'll guarantee that most of your budgets have not gone up uh, in that same uh, ratio. And so uh, part of this challenge for us is integrating all this stuff, right place, right time, right things, and somehow uh, being innovative enough to actually uh, reduce our work. Uh, information consumers, again, uh, Donald Farmer uh, has that picture of recognizing a snake uh, in the grass. And for those of you that didn't see the presentation, you'll have to. And so uh, what he refers to there is that as human beings, we have this innate skill to recognize things very quickly. And so uh, again, I think that the um, 
kind of information world now is heading much more towards this in terms of managing enterprises as opposed to lists. But the challenge with our business is that very few um, organizations except General Dynamics sell everything from bullets to aircraft carriers. And so at General Dynamics, you know, they sell you a bullet and then they want you to move up to an assault rifle and then to a bazooka and then to a tank and then to an aircraft carrier and so on and so forth. We have this unique business where at the major gift level, we have a whole bunch of data that's very rich and usually very accurate. But in order to fill that funnel and that pipeline, we have to address that broader base. And so I think in terms of the, um, the visualization stuff is fine for this, but unfortunately, we're still going to be dealing with a lot of lists and a lot of very granular things. And so I think it's a, um, our business is inherently more challenging in terms of the data exercise because it's hard to address both simultaneously and both well all the time for all the groups of people within your organization. Our organization is about 80% major gifts, and yet from a service um, area, 80% of our time is spent on annual giving, which is about 7% of our revenue. And so it's a hard balance for us to maintain because if, if we were to look at revenue and where we're spending our time, we, we should be spending 80% of our time supporting the major gifts part of the organization, but in order to fill our pipeline, we have to do both. This was a graph is also an interesting uh, example of culture change within our own organization. Uh, this was actually one that we uh, presented to the board at the last board meeting. So I've been there five years. It was the first time we ever showed them something that with the dual axis. And they actually understood what it meant. You know, uh, five years ago we couldn't have done that because they had never seen anything uh, kind of like this. So again, information consumers, uh, you know, mobile is certainly uh, exploded. If you manage a website and look at mobile traffic over the last five years, uh, typically you may have gone from 2% to 25%. That's a very, very short time frame. And I think that uh, another thing Donald Farmer mentioned is uh, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, and this has been mentioned by others during this conference, that consumers are now driving technology adoption. And so, um, you know, they're used to self-service. I can install an app on my phone and I don't have to go ask the central IT people. And that's uh, you know, quite a change. Uh, people are buying apps which are not full-blown applications. Um, I, for instance, uh, use Outlook all the time, but I have no idea of what all the features in Outlook are. And so if I have an app like uh, Evernote or something, I can figure out that app in like 10 minutes and know how to use it, or Dropbox, or some of these other things. And I think that... Um, you know, how do we leverage that idea of self-service within our own organizations in a very in an effective way? Um, self-service is good for the users. It's also good for us. Because if someone has to come and ask me to run a report, then that means I'm not uh, being able to have fun doing the things I want to do or being creative or, or doing something that's actually uh, more interesting. Any questions at all? Everybody's paying rapt attention. All your eyes are still open. Uh, so I'm either incredibly interesting or, <laughs> or uh, you're wondering uh, what's going to happen there. And so um, the other thing, I, this is again fairly uh, obvious to it. I think that um, you know, these are you know, it's kind of big, big trends. And I think that key for us is many of these old limitations that uh, disk space, bandwidth, um, you know, network access, all that stuff is really, really behind us. We don't have to think in terms of those constraints anymore. Uh, unless you're Amazon or a cell company, uh, you can, you know, do a lot of this stuff on a laptop now. In fact, you could run most of your organization off of a laptop. Um, and this is, again, quite a change for us. I certainly think that in term, one of the big trends I've seen um, in fundraising in the last five years especially is uh, the introduction of data mining and statistical analysis into our organizations. And I think that that's uh, a skill set that, uh, you know, is going to be uh, something that's going to be essential as we go forward. Fundraising has become, uh, I think, more competitive. Uh, the self-service aspect is also translated into uh, crowdfunding. It's translated into, I can set up a website in 10 minutes, and I can have a, a giving form there, and people can give directly. Uh, they don't need to have an interface with my organization, and they don't have to pay 
you know, the cost of fundraising and so on and so forth. So um, again, you know, these are things that I think that will really uh, continue to affect us. And of course, the new world is very visual. And uh, this was actually uh, one of the first kind of live public visualizations that it was the Oakland crime spotting uh, visualization. And so you can go to this website and you can say, I want to go for a walk at 6 o'clock in the morning at a certain neighborhood. So I want to turn this dial to that time and see what crimes have been committed in that neighborhood over time. And then what you can do is you can filter down by uh, what type of crime. So you can say, I just want to see murders in this geographical area at 8 o'clock at night because I need to go to the liquor store. <laughs> right, and then you can make that decision. But the, I think the idea here, though, is, is that it actually uh, it draws you into the experience, right? And it, you don't have to think about, uh, you know, what type of query do I write to show me where those crimes are. The other fun thing here, because it's web-enabled, is you can click on this, and it actually goes and shows you the criminal if they've caught them, and the sentence, and a bunch of other facts. Uh, you know, if they're still looking for them, they can actually have a reward posted. So it's, uh, you know, it, uh, they haven't updated it for a while. And it doesn't work very well anymore. So maybe crime has, uh, with the economy, has kind of decreased. And so they haven't had to maintain it as, as, as well. So anyway, uh, that's kind of, I think, the uh, sort of the bigger broad brush, broad brush picture. And I think we've heard uh, quite a bit of it already. Uh, this fellow here is uh, kind of like some of our information environments. Uh, we've kind of rested, uh, kind of rested on maybe our laurels. Uh, Carl Otto, in his presentation, referred to the TED Talks and the God Complex and how it's easy for IT to kind of uh, uh, be a little bit uh, maybe not as accountable as we need to be because everybody depends on us. And so I think it's important to uh, maybe not relax as much as this person is. Um, our transactional systems, I think that uh, we use Razor's Edge. Is that he went from Blackbot in the room? It's an incredible product. Uh, <laughs> if those of you who have ever worked on a farm and had to milk cows, uh, how many have done that, actually milked a cow? OK, uh, I won't say anything more. Uh, it's actually not bad. It's, uh, you know, it's, we're used to using it. it, it you know, it's able to record all its transactions. Uh, we're able to put everything in there that we essentially need to put in. Uh, the challenge is, though, is that it's not, as most transactional systems, not very good for providing aggregate information. And I think what we've seen over, years, over the years is all vendors have come forth and said, well, here's our transactional system. We're going to have some aggregated stuff in, like cumulative giving uh, and things like that. But there's never, it's not one or the other. And so I think that, um, you know, these things, uh, we talked, you know, this conference is you know, data discovery, foraging for data giving users the power to ask questions and find answers themselves. Uh, our um, transactional systems, typically there's a long cycle between big upgrades because there's a lot of legacy customers. It's, you know, legacy code. And this is not, uh, you know, uh, it's blackboard. It's, it's most companies out there. Uh, we're seeing new models such as uh, Salesforce and products that have a um, sort of continual and updating ecosystem. But, you know, again, uh, a lot of us are not ready to make those moves yet. And some of those products are not as uh, uh, well developed um, as they need to be. The other thing here, too, is that ironically, uh, the staff that understand the most about the data and how it ties together are often gift processing. And the executive level team that's running the organization, uh, whenever you give stuff to them that has more than two or three data points, they have trouble with that. You know, and so uh, they're not understanding, in a lot of cases, the, um, you know, what the actual story is that the data is telling them. Our reporting environments, so how many people are still using Excel as their primary tool? And don't be shy. I mean, this is not uncommon. Uh, Microsoft, one of their big um, BI strategy points is Excel because uh, they have 400 million users. So, you know, uh, why not, you know, take advantage of that user base? How many are using Tableau? How many have deployed Tableau across the organization? So one. And I know Ryerson is working on that. Um, how many people are using Tableau Desktop themselves? Uh, Click. Uh, Spotfire. Uh, Cognos. 
So, number five, no, uh, others? What? Shout it out. Jasper Soft, Jasper Soft okay. Business objects. Crystal. Crystal, yeah. So, lots of tools out there. So, again, I think a lot of this is, um, you know, fairly uh, agnostic as far as tools, but I think with tools, you want to look at things like, uh, you know, how is information actually shared? Uh, you know, can those tools be used for discovery? And I think a lot of us in our traditional uh, reporting environments are, are pretty limited by a lot of the things that are in here. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to walk around the office and, and look what's in printers, right? Because uh, you find some amazing things in printers, things that you never thought of doing yourself, but all, all of a sudden they're becoming uh, stuff that's carried to meetings. And of course it's outdated, it's generally wrong. It has dollar signs in every column, uh, sometimes pennies, you know, all the great things. So, um, you know, th these are things that uh, are fairly common uh, that I think we need to be uh, sort of cognizant of and uh, kind of look at. And I think uh, where to now, you know, obviously there's uh, these new tools that are quite exciting uh, to use. But I think that uh, for me, one of the, the key points here is that I think this requires a lot of new skill sets. And so uh, as a technical person, I don't like people. Those of you that know me have heard me say this a number of times. Uh, it's true. Uh, but I think that, again, uh, so one of the things I always have to work on is that whole communication thing, plus also the uh, idea of being an artisan, because these new tools have uh, you know, lots of color choices. And so uh, do you know how to use a color wheel and know what colors are complementary? Um, at our own organization, I, it took me a long time to convince them that green meant good and red meant bad, and yellow meant something in between, because on all the stuff they gave out to the board, those colors were reversed. So what they were doing was always telling the board just from color the wrong thing. So things that were really good were red, and so they would, the board would be like, have this confused kind of expression on their face. Um, so again, I think that these new tools, um, especially, uh, you have to think about things like that. Uh, you know, do you know how to use Photoshop? Because the other thing that's become quite prevalent is the idea of using infographics and the idea that data and information needs to actually tell a story. Or a story. And a story has a plot, and it has a beginning, and it has an end. And so um, if we move away from printed reports, how do we tell that story differently? How do we have annotations? How do we have that um, set up in a way that's uh, believable, right, compelling, uh, tells the right thing, and gives the organization direction? And I, I don't think it's an easy exercise. Um, and the other thing with this skill set now is that um, there's not very many if they're just starting to see them. But there's not very many academic programs out right now that teach business analysis, because it crosses multiple disciplines. And so our technical people may have some business acumen, but may not be good communicators. Our business people may not have technology skills or understanding of database or the importance of data quality. And I think that when you look at kind of business analysis or business analysts as a discipline, um, again, there's not a lot of programs out there that really um, teach that. Um, it was interesting in uh, Vancouver, uh, one of the local technical schools uh, started a program to do that and I was on the, uh, a focus group that helped them kind of figure out what were the core subject areas that people would want to focus on. And there was a number of people from, uh, a few from nonprofits, uh, mostly from industry in the room as part of that focus group and it was quite interesting to hear that conversation. Uh, there's a statistic that in the U.S., uh, the business analyst skill, there's something like a shortage of about 10 million positions over the next 15 to 20 years. And so if there's a, this pent-up demand for these uh, kind of new skill sets across these, uh, across these boundaries. Uh, Pete Seeger, uh, amazing individual, full of energy, uh, passed away about, uh, I think, three weeks ago now. Uh, he released his uh, last album with new, ma new material, not old material, but new material at 92. Um, part of his life's work was actually doing uh, sing-alongs along the Hudson River, and uh, money went to charity to clean up the Hudson. So uh, it's a good example of uh, uh, kind of persistence and everything in all this, and I think that it's a lesson that we can all uh, carry forward. So now we'll get into uh, uh, data warehouse stuff. Um, any questions or comments or anything? 
Those donuts are kicking in, I can just tell. <laughs> um, they were good donuts. I actually wanted to have a plate of those for lunch instead of the other stuff. But instead, I felt I needed to compensate, so I had some lettuce. Um, so a data warehouse. How many people have a, a data warehouse or a reporting environment or whatever? Yeah. So I think the important point is to have one here and not to get hung up on the complications of the actual what it is. Uh, because like anything else, if you are going to go on and say, well, do we need a star schema or do we need something else or do we need to model this or we need to do this or that, sometimes when you say data warehouse, the discussion gets so complicated and so convoluted and then you start to hear timelines of, oh, well, that'll take like seven years and, or five years or it'll take two years, three years, nine years and you kind of never get started on the project and, and never get done. And so um, this is especially true, uh, I think, when you have to deal with a large central organization that actually is creating a formal data warehouse that's connected to everything in the enterprise. I think that within fundraising, uh, because we are an opportunity-driven business, it's important to be nimble and it's important to be quick. And so I think uh, I've always erred on the side of uh, begging forgiveness as opposed to asking permission and just starting on a project that gets the thing going. Uh, because if you don't start, um, you'll never uh, uh, gain anything. And so again, very uh, you know, typical uh, you know, kind of hierarchy of things. Uh, to me, a data warehouse is kind of at this tactical level in that uh, you need this sort of standardization of data uh, you know, put there in a way that you can understand it and utilize it. And, and the strategic piece is the whole idea of the uh, visualizations and business intelligence and, and how you put that out to your end, end uh, consumers. And again, um, you know, you take data, uh, we do it every night, you transform it, form it, then you load it in the data warehouse. Uh, the other thing I would mention in terms of this um, loading into the data warehouse, um, a lot of people use um, an ETL tool, which is extract, transform, load, and there's a lot of these tools out there. Uh, Michael Westerkamp, uh, who has a lot of knowledge in this, uh, mentioned this yesterday in terms of um, alluded to the idea that, uh, again, if you're, uh, if this gets too complicated, an ETL tool can have a life of its own. You can have two people devo uh, devoted to your, to, your, to your ETL tool and that's all they do is maintain that tool because it, it's a separate tool and these tools are big. And so whenever you're looking at uh, creating a reporting environment, always also too in terms of what you're doing, think of your real capabilities. Uh, I was at an um, organization in Vancouver They'd asked me to come in and talk to them briefly about an approach to this. And uh, so one of the first things I did was I just went around. The, there was about 10 people in the room. And so uh, skills, uh, SQL, no. Uh, ETL, no. Okay. SQL, yes. ETL, no. And so uh, the recommendation there was just use SQL scripts that everybody can read to get started. Don't bother buying an ETL tool or installing an ETL tool because uh, you just don't have enough people with the right skills that this point in time to actually add that extra piece in, right? And if we go back also to the slides on uh, the old limitations, uh, you don't necessarily need a comp complicated ETL tool in terms of performance anymore. You just buy a bigger server and you can still use SQL scripts and the thing will still load more or less on the same time. So um, some of you, of course, will have an ETL tool, but you also may have central expertise that helps you run that and does the upgrades and things like that too. So that changes the equation, right? The main point here is to actually, uh, you know, try and get moving as fast as you uh, can. Uh, for me, uh, the real uh, benefits of a data warehouse are somewhat hidden in that uh, I do it because I'm lazy. And the, the, how it makes me able to be lazy is, uh, for instance, if I have to do a spreadsheet of something, I want to find a way that I don't have to do that anymore. If I have to run, uh, you know, a custom query and you know, try and figure out how to do that. I don't want to do that more than once or twice. And, and you know, I'm, and then I'm looking for another way to do that. Um, and so for a big part for me, it's just the re, re, reusable code in a data warehouse. You can encapsulate things like business rules and you can put them in one place. And if your business rule changes, you change it in one place and all your reports and everything else will automatically change to reflect that change in business rule. That's a lot different than having 100 reports and having to go into each report and change the logic in each report. So for me, that, again, is a big time saver. Uh, the other thing, of course, is one version of the truth. 
Um, we had at, at, uh, I worked at University of Toronto when I first started there. It was fairly dysfunctional. They had uh, five analysts, and they each worked in different areas. And each year they had to do this uh, thing called the Business Board Report, which was about a 55, 60-page report that went to governance. <coughs> and it was what determined the university's budget. So each one of these analysts would uh, create information using um, Impromptu, which was a Cognos tool, which essentially was allowed them to download um, a set of data into a spreadsheet. Then they would all get together in a room and they would argue about their spreadsheets because no one could figure out which one was right. And then the next thing they would argue about is how come this year didn't compare to last year and how, could they, how come they couldn't generate the same numbers from last year to do the comparisons and make sure the current year data was right. And so that was a huge, huge dysfunction that used to take months to put that report together. And you know, when you start at an organization, there's you know, the first two days you're thinking, why the hell did I do this? Because you're hearing all these bad words in the culture, right? And business board report where you could tell because people would say it with horror. Oh, business board report, right? And um, you, know, you can find this dysfunction just about anywhere. Uh, the other thing is real time. So um, you know, in other words, having information as close to real time as possible. I think for most of our businesses, within 24 hours is as good as it really needs to be. Uh, it's not like we can mail out something and change it in an hour. You know, so 24 hours is pretty good. Um, this has been drummed into me over the years. Anytime you do a project like this, have a plan. Uh, there's a lot of studies out there that show that organizations that have a good IT plan actually are better at their IT and better uh, service delivery. And so have a plan. Uh, I hate having to do a plan because, you know, of course, I know it's everything is in here. Uh, the plan also helps you with um, uh, kind of communicating to your users and also uh, keeping them aware that things actually take time and that there's a priority order. And if they want to change the order, then that's something that's out of plan or out of scope. And where do they want to fit that in? And how do they want to juggle other things? Right? So that plan can help you in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, another thing with the data warehouse, think about what your information goals are. And uh, kind of the idea of this is uh, think about what you want to have. And then think about the sources of data that it's actually going to come from. So one of the questions we get all the time is, well, how do we benchmark against other organizations in town? Right? And so this is problematic because the benchmarking data is nothing that's in our system. Right? So in Canada, you can go to the uh, Canadian Revenue Agency. It's like the CRS site. And you can go to the charitable tax returns, and then you can bring back the information for people that made returns. So that's how we do benchmarking. So how do you get that in your data warehouse? So our approach there is because that information is fairly um, unstructured, is we actually put that in the data warehouse in special spreadsheets. Then we read those spreadsheets into tables so we can join that up with our own data. So then we can say out of the five major um, charitable foundations in Vancouver, uh, which ones have gained market share over the last um, five years. And we only need to update their information once a year based on their charitable return when it becomes public. So again, that, this exercise of thinking about if benchmarking is one of your goals, uh, you know, first of all, where do you get that information from? And then how do you combine it in a way that actually kind of automates it as much as possible? And if you go through these kind of exercises, it helps you in your planning and helps you really um, uh, be efficient. Efficient. In terms of tools, um, this is a major change for me. Uh, based on, uh, I've been using uh, a particular visualization tool, Tableau, for uh, about three years now. And uh, what I would suggest is actually uh, get your visualization tool first and figure out how to use that tool first before anything else. Uh, because what that does, what it has done for me especially, is um, it allows you to do very quick looks at your data without having to write SQL code. So I can do the, uh, go in there and drag and drop things and immediately see where outliers are or, or things that are not described well in the data so that I have to look them up. And, and so what that does, it gives you sort of immediate feedback in terms of what you're trying to develop because you start to right away start to, you know, what's been alluded to uh, this morning, you know, the idea of asking questions, the idea of discovery. And you know, um, I'm really familiar with our data, but every time I'm looking at it, there's things I find that I just know, or that I don't understand, or didn't recognize because data, you know, as you know, changes over time, codes change over time, intent changes over time, and you know, uh, if you can see that, 
gets really, really efficient. The other thing it does is um, fundraisers are notorious for uh, as soon as you show them something, they go, oh, that's great, but I want this other thing in there. And of course, they don't know this, but that other thing comes from some other table and some other part of the system. And so, you, oh my God, you got to go back and redo the whole thing. So, uh, what these visualization tools allow you to do is really iterate quickly through that design cycle. So, um, I can give them something, and then an hour later, I can say, here's the view you asked for. Here's a different view. Here's a different view. You know, and so they can start to see right away, um, you know, what 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 they're looking at. Because it's not always obvious to them because they don't necessarily uh, understand uh, patterns, right? And then the other thing uh, we've done at the foundation I'm at is there's, you know, the, the visual tools which are used by a couple of us. And that's uh, mostly because we don't really have uh, that business analyst skill in the foundation with our staff. We're a small staff, 55 people. Uh, you know, 35 of them are in the fundraising area. The rest are kind of in the operations support, um, you know, donor relations area. So, um, you know, what we've done is we've used reporting services to provide them with that very kind of guided, um, you know, structured things. Uh, we have a lot of prompts, so the reports are flexible, and that allows them to break down things into the subsets they need. And so that's been uh, quite successful. So, um, again, you know, your second tier and then other, t other tools, uh, uh, kind of third. Any questions on this? Your first? So did, that, did everyone hear that? Yes? The person that's asleep in the far corner there. Did you hear that? <laughs> Good. Um, Yeah, I think it, I th yeah, to, to me, a data warehouse is simply a thing that uh, where you can combine data in different ways that you may not have thought of before that facilitates your ability to get information out. And so, um, you know, maybe you do have a central data warehouse, and maybe those folks are giving you everything you need. And so, you know, I wouldn't create one. I would work on with the central people in terms of the enhancements I needed, right? And so that's a different approach than what we've done, which is we don't have that centrally. And so we have built that ourselves in-house. And so uh, to me, that's really, again, sort of the idea of uh, um, not to get hung up on the complication of the terminology. Because you can talk about slowly changing text dimensions and all kinds of things and get really buried in that lexicon and not actually get reports out of the system. In some organizations, though, you, it will be more formal and more structured. and, and so I think. The other piece of that is always, uh, what's the balance between central and decentral, and which things you want to control, and which things are you going to relinquish control, and what's your own internal capacity, uh, capacity as kind of a separate part of the organization. And so I think that kind of de also defines uh, what your reporting environment is going to be like. I think one of the challenges with central uh, groups, and I think they try hard, but I think they're very resource constrained, and I think that uh, the other thing is, uh, Central groups will tend to focus on things like financial and HR reporting, which, quite frankly, for the most part, is fairly static. Uh, development reporting is all about marketing and sales. And so it tends to be, uh, there, uh, if you look at your ad hoc versus standard report ratios, uh, most shops have a pretty high ratio of ad hoc compared to standard uh, than the finance group would. Right? Because you know, we use PeopleSoft as an example for the financial system. And uh, those reports change once every six months because we need to add a new account into the trial balance or we need to have another line on the financial statements. Our uh, development or fundraising reports change weekly depending on um, you know, what people are running and also what uh, kind of demand they have for whatever information. 
Uh, so this is actually just a uh, uh, kind of a very uh, practical uh, mundane. This would be technically the part of the presentation that's deep dive uh, and highly technical even though it's not highly technical and it's not super deep. Uh, in Razor's Edge and uh, we have appeal codes and what appeal codes are for us is actually uh, how did we ask for the money and I think most of us have appeal codes or solicitation codes or, or something, right? Uh, and in our uh, organization, uh, each gift can only have one appeal code and uh, the appeal code uh, attached to the gift determines which program uh, gets credit for actually raising that gift. So uh, the appeal codes tie into budgeting, they tie into resource allocation, they tie into what we report to the board. So they kind of drive every uh, bit of revenue reporting for our particular business. And again, uh, this is violating uh, the CODS normalization rules. You're never supposed to have information embedded in a primary key. But in this case, it's direct mail July lapse, uh, 2013 dollars. So uh, we're violating the rules uh, right from the start. Uh, and this is uh, this uh, uh, program we use called Razor's Edge. I'm probably violating our license agreement by showing this in public. But uh, <laughs> uh, and so appeals have <coughs> some stuff in them, and then they have some tabs here where you can add different things in. So they're actually uh, um, given the age of Razor's Edge. I think it's about 15 years old as a product. Uh, you know, they're, they're fairly uh, flexible in terms of uh, being able to define things. Uh, when I started at the organization, they had one report uh, to manage their entire business. It was called the analytical report. And uh, heaven forbid that they should see this presentation on YouTube. Uh, there was one person that was responsible for maintaining the data, the system. Her name was Sandy. She worked three days a week uh, for an organization that had grown from five staff to 50. She worked there for 14 years. She ran the database, did all the razor's edge queries, all the mailings, all the extractions, all the reporting, fixed the toaster, ordered the photocopier cartridges, and generally dealt with anything else that was plugged in. So it was a pretty impossible task. And this was the report she created to run uh, the uh, organization, the analytical report. So the business process was that uh, uh, you would close gift processing, run the report, distribute it to the fundraising programs. They would run queries in razor's edge to verify the report. Then they would reconcile this report to the financial statements. And of course, this never worked. Um, there were 780 appeal codes, and there was, the logic was in this report to uh, kind of deal with, all, with a complicated if-then-else statement. And so you would always add a couple of appeal codes per month, and then Sandy would be away, because she didn't come in on Thursdays. And so, of course, that didn't work. Uh, it was an impossible task. And so they were getting their fundraising information um, you know, three to four weeks on average after the month end. And so they were essentially using their financial statements to manage their performance. And so they weren't managing their performance at all. Uh, this was the uh, schema. So this is the real deep stuff. Uh, again, I'm violating our license agreement probably by showing the secret schema. Uh, you can see here some of the naming conventions and things, um, and so on and so forth. And the other thing, whenever you design a, where, a data warehouse, think about the flexibility. And Starbucks, because we're in Seattle here, has uh, been good in terms of flexibility. So if you go to um, um, Google, you can like, search for the most complicated Star Starbucks drink. And this is what came up a couple weeks ago. A personal cup, venti, sugar-free, vanilla, non-fat, and soy, half-pump almond, and a half-pump mocha, two pumps, sugar-free, cinnamon dolce, with upside down, whipped caramel macchiato. I was behind that guy in line. Yeah. <laughs> He says he was behind that guy in line. All of us have been behind them, and that's when you just like offer to pay for their stuff just to make it happen faster. Um, and we heard about that on the first day, about picking up garbage on a piece every day on the street, how it like, makes the world better. Um, so again, uh, these are some of the things to think about. And we do this every time we design a script. We want to look at you know, what, what is kind of the output of this, what drop downs are going to appear on reports, how are people going to consume all this stuff, how is it going to be displayed. And you want to design uh, accordingly. And so here's, again, an example of a script. And uh, those that are better at SQL will not mock this. Uh, I make my analysts or programmers, programmer analysts crazy because if they bring me a script to review, the first thing I say, it's not formatted right. I don't care if it works or not. I can't read it. Uh, because if I uh, can't instantly read it, I know a month from now I'll be able to even read it last. And so I always try to. Uh, look at um, 
first of all, readability and understandability. So I don't let them do anything elegant or mathematical or, you know, I try to sit, make them create temporary tables instead of doing joins. Uh, I don't like self joins because I kind of don't understand that. I've got five minutes. Um, but we've put in things here, for instance, like uh, descriptions and codes. Uh, we've put in here fiscal dates, and those are all based on functions so that we can really, uh, you know, reuse that code. So an example, uh, our gift pyramid is a function. If we need to change our gift pyramid levels, we change the function, all the reports change. All the drop downs are updated. Uh, we only have to change it in one place. So uh, the other thing we do is for each appeal code, we add in which uh, program is responsible for the fundraising. So again, we've added uh, fields in that don't exist in the, in the production database, in the transaction system. Uh, you then, you know, what I typically do is once the uh, programmers create a table for me, I then use uh, the visual tool to kind of go and look at that data and start to find things like outliers, descriptions that don't make sense, uh, some calculations I need to do that haven't been put in there. And so that really helps that design cycle help, and help a lot faster. And I also look at things like, you know, what are the complex, do I have to do any joins in the visual tool? Ideally, uh, I like the tables to be flat and wide with a lot of descriptions so I can do the least amount of joins in the visual tool. Uh, just because, again, I don't like joins because it makes my life more complicated. Because I have to think about, is it a left outer, inner, right outer? You know, it's, you know, I don't have the Venn diagram like in the tool to look at, so I never can remember that stuff. Um, the other thing we do is uh, all these columns that have kind of uh, cryptic names, we rename all those columns so that when we're using, again, the visual tool or someone downloads this table into a spreadsheet, which they can also do, uh, the uh, um, codes are more uh, understood. And the other thing is that each code here, uh, column, has the uh, table name as a preference. So if you're joining two tables and they have the same primary key, like parent ID, you can immediately tell which one is on which side of the join. So again, it just makes uh, things a little bit uh, clear, uh, clearer. Uh, so again, new information. Um, we've also added, um, you know, calculations in the tables. Question. Documentation. <laughs> 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 That's the donut surfacing. <laughs> it's the sugar rush of documentation. Uh, we actually, uh, I'm responsible for documentation, so of course it doesn't get done as much as it needs to. My, uh, my uh, response is, of course, this is self-documenting. Um, I do have a tool called, uh, that's used for documentation, and so when I do document a table, and I actually do, do a number of them, we then create documentation that describes all the fields. And then we use the extended properties in SQL Server and record those field names and what they do in the descriptions as part of that documentation. It's just not as done as uh, often as we could. So again, these are uh, calculated fields we've added. So total gifts, maximum gift for, for the field, and so on and so forth. You could also derive this by joining the gift table to the fields. But then you know these calculations are already embedded, so you don't have to do that. Uh, we then create reports. This is reporting services. Uh, and again, all those descriptions up here as drop downs. And so every night when the data warehouse populates, if we add something, add a code, you know, those things are already populated in the reports. We don't have to do anything else. We have scripts that prop, uh, populate views uh, with uh, descriptions and codes that are used as drop downs. And then users can subscribe to these things. This has been big. We also have a data cleanup strategy. Oh, for those of you uh, that want to buy the new case advancement services book when it comes out in six months, there will be a chapter on this exact thing on the data cleanup piece here and also on this appeal thing. So um, it'll be available for Christmas for stuffing and stocking, probably. Um, we also monitor data cleanup. So if we think about that first screen, you know, there were things on there that people need to fill in. Uh, we monitor data uh, quality over time. So this is an example of uh, the errors and then how many uh, uh, estimated hours it would take to clean up a particular error. This is the aggregate view. We also have a by table, and then we also have rules within tables. So we can do things like look at 
uh, fundraisers as an example and say who, which fundraiser has the most error rate over time, which errors do they have and how is that changing. So we also, uh, again, um, you always have to remember the human component. And uh, again, uh, subscribing. I'm going fast because I'm running out of time. I'm getting the, I got the two minute hook. I'm down to probably eight seconds. And we still have 50 more slides to go through. Uh, things like this, and you know, integrate analytics into meetings. Uh, if, you, if you go to meetings and see a lot of spreadsheets, uh, kind of get a hold of those spreadsheets and see how you can replace them. Uh, we had a uh, we had quarterly planning meetings, and uh, I mentioned checking the printers. Uh, I like to look at people's monitors and seeing where they're cutting and pasting things. Uh, some little tricks like that to see where people are kind of uh, need to be counseled. And the other part of this is again uh, what we've moved towards. This is using InfoPath, uh, which is part of Office. Uh, we've used again standard forms. So if someone needs to set up an appeal, they have to fill out this form, which has drop downs and data controls in, in, in advance, so they can also. So it forces them to think about the things they need to consider when they're setting up an appeal, because it does drive all of our uh, information stuff. Uh, this is just a success metric. So we also keep track and measure all the times the reports are being run. So when we first started the data warehouse in this year, there were 3,600. And nine months year to date, there were 22,000 reports run. Again, that's for a staff of 55. So to me, that's a pretty good um, growth in terms of people actually using the reports. Uh, the flip side of this is the number of queries that are running in Razor's Edge and creating spreadsheets has actually dropped at almost the same rate. So, it, you know, it's the kind of best of both worlds. We've been able to uh, actually use the data warehouse to, to generate a substantial amount of efficiency. And by measuring and reporting on this, we can also demonstrate this to the senior management uh, as to the value of investing in this project. Uh, blah, blah, blah. These are all our wonderful success stories, and they're all true. As most presentations, everything is, of course, true. And it's, um, I think that the challenge for me right now with this is that people are relying on it too much. And so the, the irony of this is you know, they're running 22,000 reports, but they're not asking as many questions about certain pieces of data that they should be. So I'm actually concerned now that they're too comfortable with the data. And they're not always, um, we have a couple people who are really good that say, you know, this can't be right. And you know, when we wrote the program, uh, it was right in our minds. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges, I think, going forward. So thanks again very much uh, uh, for your time and everything. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, feel, by all means, feel free to email me. Uh, do not call me, because I don't uh, answer the phone. <laughs> and I will respond to you. If I check email all the time, and we'll respond to you a lot quicker. So uh, again, don't be shy if you have uh, something that uh, you want to uh, talk about. Thanks.